So like Kara said, I'm a professional services engineer with Puppet Labs. I've been working with Puppet for about four, or at Puppet Labs for about the last two years. About two years prior to that, I was using Puppet uh, at my last job as a sysadmin. Um, so I apologize if this talk sort of leans technical. Um, that's, that's sort of my thing. Um, I'll try to keep it acceptable for the management types in the room. Um, here's my contact information up here. Um, Feel free to hit me up at any of these. Uh, I'm usually very responsive on email and IRC, so if you guys have any questions, anything that you want to ask about afterwards that uh, we don't really cover here, there's going to be some time for questions afterwards, but feel free to shoot me a message if you want to take that down. Um, so real quick, can I just see a, by show of hands, how many people are using Puppet right now? Wow, okay, that's great. Um, and of those people, how many of you have been using it for more than a year? All right, more than two years, more than three years, four years? Wow, okay, that's pretty good. Um, and so of, you, of, of all of you who raised your hand as public users, how many are currently using uh, something in the 2.x series? So 2.7, 2.6, any of you using 0.25 or any of those releases? Yes, okay. This is the first time where nobody raised their hand for that one. It makes me really happy. Um, how many of you are on the 3 Series? So 3.0 or higher. That's good. All right, awesome. Hopefully we can, hopefully we can get some more hands up for 3 the next time here. Um, uh, it's really awesome you should upgrade. Um, and, then, and, and again, everybody there, how many people are using Puppet Enterprise? Wow, oh, okay. It, it's funny, you walk around these places and uh, every Puppet camp is different, the sort of balance of who's using Enterprise versus open source and who's on 2 versus 3. Uh, this is about what I expect for the DC area. I'm guessing a lot of you are working government. Yeah? Cool. So, um, we're kind of in an interesting spot, technologically speaking. We have been for the last few years in terms of the way that, uh, that everything's working. It's kind of one of those problems where we're in a really good place, but we're also in a pretty bad place. Um, everything is sort of rapidly expanding. We have uh, more servers, more services, uh, more things that we need to be managing, and that number is only increasing. There's more and more stuff that constantly needs to be handled and managed by us as sysadmins or as developers. Um, and on top of all of that, everything needs to be faster. So it doesn't, it's no longer acceptable to take nine months to get a server into production. It's no longer acceptable to take one month to get a server into production. You can't be doing quarterly releases of your software. You just can't, because somebody's going to eat your clones and eat your lunch in the market if you try to go that way. Um, so additionally, you can't hire, say, one sysadmin for every 100 servers anymore. There's just way too many servers. We've, we've kind of reached a point in Moore's Law where we're scaling out way more rapidly than we're scaling up. And so it's not enough to just get a bigger and bigger mainframe or a bigger and bigger you know, quad, quad socket, CPU, whatever, R900 or something. Shows how big I am. Uh, um, it just doesn't work that it just doesn't, doesn't work that way anymore. We need to change things much much faster than we used to. Um, and of course, a lot of the things that were standing in our way before that made it take so long to get stuff going is no longer the case. Um, a sysadmin now can spin up thousands of machines in 20 minutes easily. You know, it's not like you have to go to the data center and rack every single one of these where you have some sort of natural constraint that's in place that makes it slower for you to actually roll things out. And your developers and your users are expecting that. They, they want to be able to get those machines up really, really fast. And when it's slow, guess who that falls on? Right? Um, so it's sort of up to us to get these things out much faster and keep it going. You need to be able to ship code you know, weekly, daily, hourly sometimes. Everything needs to be much, much faster. And there's really no excuse anymore for it not to be. Um, so in sort of reaction to this new environment, IT has been changing a lot. And I think in the next five, 10 years, it's going to be a completely different landscape. Nobody who's been a sysadmin 10 years ago is even going to recognize it. Everybody's job, job function is basically changing. We have all these movements like DevOps. Uh, we have lots of things going into software as a service, um, more so than we used to. Uh, infrastructure as a service in particular, you know, everything's sort of cloud-based now. Um, I hate to say that word because it's misused so much, but that's, that's what it is. Um, a lot more applications are, are working in more of a web operations style than more of the traditional sysadmin style than we used to. Even, even some old sort of older clunky applications are trying to work in this environment now. Um, so really, there is no future where we have less servers. We're only going to have more. There's no, ser there's no future where we'll have fewer services that we need to manage, or that the services are going to somehow be less critical than they used to be. Everything is getting bigger and faster and more important, and that number is not going to go down. And so we need tooling that enables us to sort of work within that. 
And, and yes, these sort of simple software as a service solutions, they sort of set that trend. And you know, a lot of you, probably a lot of like uh, big critical government services working in here, um, you say, well, we can't really do that. That's not, that's not the way that we operate or that's not the way that it works for us. And, and maybe right now or a few years ago it seemed that way, but that's really not the case anymore. So these software as a service companies are sort of setting the trend, um, but really it's the enterprise that pays the bills, right? You have, a, you have important services, they need to work, um, and now we're kind of at the point where these services need to catch up to the old ones, or catch up to these new ones. So sort of enterprise is sort of chasing after SaaS, but it's catching up, and a lot of large companies have. Um, so obviously Puppet is what I'm gonna say is, the, is a major helping, helpful solution in all of this. It is not the only solution. Uh, there's a lot of things outside of the Puppet ecosystem that you still need to work on, but it's been my experience, and maybe I'm biased, <laughs> And that Puppet ends up being at the center of a lot of these changes, where where Puppet tools are used to drive this and sort of act as the the central focal point around everything else. Uh, and hopefully, I can sort of give you an idea as we go on to this about why that is and why Puppet and configuration management is so important uh, in order to keep up with the speed of change. <coughs> so about eight and a half years ago is when Puppet started. That is a long time ago. Wow. Um, uh, basically started uh, out of a disdain from the current set of tooling that existed. There was very little out there to do configuration management um, in, in a good, you know, sort of infrastructure as code, reliable, effective way. Uh, that's, that's obviously changed now, Puppets, Puppets now, there's, there's competitors out there. Um, uh, but, but there was sort of just a, a, a disdain for the existing tool set. Uh, and so Luke Knees, our founder, um, invented Puppet or developed Puppet to be a sort of simple way that people could manage their systems that they would actually like to use. And that's the important thing that really sort of drove Puppet over other tools is that we wanted something that people would actually use because you could have the best tools in the world and if nobody wants to use them, they're useless. <coughs> um, so uh, Puppet primarily works around data center, cloud automation, again, there's that, that cloud word. Um, and, and honestly, it's really important if you're using something like AWS, if you're in GCE, if you're uh, you know, if you're in rack space and you're dynamically provisioning servers over and over and over again, you need some kind of configuration management like this, and Puppet excels at that. Um, the vast majority of Puppet use is gonna be used for managing servers. However, uh, in the last couple of years, we've started to expand a lot into network and storage device management, and so you're seeing a lot more of that now. We have partnerships with a lot of network device vendors. We're actually shipping Puppet agents on their switches and on their networking devices specifically to manage those with Puppet. Um, there's also a lot of companies, a lot of very large installations that are doing this for end user, uh, for endpoint management, like workstations and laptops and that sort of thing. Uh, and so it's expanding a lot, and it probably will expand further than that. Um, whoop, that's not good. Keynote just got very upset with me. Oh. Sorry, technical difficulties. This is the first time it's ever happened to me where I actually had my presentation software crash. <laughs> that's why this is a tech that's why this is a tech talk. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask someone to come up here and fix it for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the language. This is sort of the key to using Puppet. Now there's there's a lot of great tools around around Puppet and a lot of things I'm gonna talk about in a little bit about how we go into actually digging in and managing things. Um, but the the thing that you will be using the majority of the time when you're working with Puppet is the Puppet DSL. This is a very simplified language and this really is what a lot of common implementations look like. You have a really simple code that just sets out exactly the state that you want your systems to be in. So here we have we're defining the package. We want to make sure that OpenSSH is installed. We want to make sure that a config file is set and that it's got certain contents configured on it. And we want to make sure that a service is running and that that service uses, relies on that SSH config file. So any of you Linux admins, this probably makes a whole ton of sense to you. And those of you who aren't Linux admins can probably figure it out pretty quickly. It's a simple, easy to understand language that reads like a configuration file. All right, and so the beauty of this is not just that we've completely defined the infrastructure state and code, it's that almost anybody can pick this up and look at it. I've heard of companies that actually take Puppet code and hand it to auditors to say, look, this is the way that our systems are configured. And then the only way to, and the only thing uh, in addition to that they need is proof is reports that say, yep, the Puppet run ran and everything is correct. And they can look at the Puppet code and say, yep, this is exactly how the servers are configured. And it makes everything easier. You get a ton of visibility. 
Um, again, I need the idea. <laughs> it's Mac, unfortunately. <laughs> You're running PowerPoint emulation. <laughs> Those of you here, I'm running PowerPoint emulation. <laughs> My screen is not blue, so I mean, like that's a good thing at least. <laughs> Crashing. But we'll find out. I'm not going to troubleshoot it in front of you right now. <laughs> All right. So this is my favorite slide. I think anytime I ever talk about anything Puppet related ever, I point to this. This is the one that, even if you've been using Pu Puppet for a while, I I'm surprised at how many people don't have this burned into their brain. This is really what Puppet is. This is what happens during a Puppet run. So we saw the code on the previous slide. I'm scared to go back to it because I'm like crashing again. Uh, but this is, this is what happens during a Puppet run. So that code sits on a Puppet master, which is a central server that all of your agents connect back to to get their configuration data. Now, that code itself is on the master compiled into what's called a catalog that sort of defines just for that specific machine that's requesting configuration exactly how it's supposed to be configured. Okay? So this is, this is sort of the important thing that Puppet does differently than any other configuration management out there that I'm aware of, in that the master is responsible for deciding all of the logic. The master figures out how should this machine be configured, and then the agent machine just says, okay, well, that's what I need to be. It doesn't do any decision making on the agent side for whether or not it needs to set something. You say a service should be running, you say a config file should be a certain way, the agent doesn't have a say in it. The master makes those decisions. Now to feed those decisions, the agent sends up a bunch of things called facts up to the master, which is a sort of uh, data that you're not going to see change very often. So things like the host name, the IP address, uh, what kind of hardware you are, how much memory you have, that sort of thing. All those facts go up to the master, which can then be used in your puppet code to help make those configuration decisions. Okay? So agent sends facts to the master. The master combines the facts with your puppet code combined with any other external sources that you have configured to build that catalog that defines the state of the system. And the agent is responsible for walking that catalog and saying, are all of these resources in the state that they should be? If they are, great, it moves on. If they're not, it fixes them. And then at the end, you get a report that goes back to the master and sent off to any number of different <coughs> report servers in all kinds of different formats that you could want uh, to say what the state of that Puppet run is for every run. Now typically, by default in Puppet, this will happen automatically every 30 minutes for every machine. So every 30 minutes you get this configuration run. So hopefully, the vast majority of your runs will actually do nothing. You're just going to verify the system state and say, yep, everything is the way that it's supposed to be. All the right packages are installed, all the right configuration files are in place with the right settings and the right ownership and the right mode and all that. Uh, all the right services are running, and then the report's going to come back and say, you can keep these historically and say, this is the state that my systems were in at this time, and this is the code that I used to get them there. Okay? Um, so taking all of this, I mean, the master and the agent are sort of the key core part of it. There's lots of other things that people will add into their infrastructure to sort of make it more useful. Um, Puppet Enterprise in particular adds a bunch of these. Um, but ultimately, the agents are going to be managing anything. They could be some machine, often uh, an infrastructure as a service cloud. They could be a VM that you're running internally on VMware or something. Uh, or they could be bare metal hardware. It doesn't matter. Puppet doesn't care. Um, the agent will manage all of those settings on the system. Uh, it'll report back to the master, which is going to have uh, graphical workflows that you could use to help with this, uh, to sort of help you view reports, to help you classify machines, to say what types of configuration data should apply to them. Um, Puppet Enterprise provides a few security options that you can use to control a lot of that. Um, and then there's all kinds of content that's going to go on there that you're going to be pulling either hopefully from your internal Git repository and probably also from the Puppet Forge, which may be feeding that internal Git repository. Okay? So Puppet Enterprise. Uh, I just want to talk real quick about what, what Puppet Enterprise is and how that helps to solve some of these problems. And then I'm going to break it down and go into each of the individual open source components or some of the major ones that come with an enterprise. Um, now there are about uh, several hundred different pieces of open source software that are bundled into Puppet Enterprise. There is, there, there, are, there is some substantial stuff that's closed source that we developed internally, but the vast majority of it is open source, uh, and we just put it together and configure it for you and set it all up. Um, it's a very solid platform, so we've tested this heavily, uh, I think. 
Um, it's supposed to be very reliable, but it is, I mean, it's software. Um, uh, it's built out of the box to be highly performant. So those of you who are using open source right now have probably noticed if you're, you might have to do some extra configuration steps to make it really scale beyond maybe 50 nodes or so. Um, we do that out of the box in Puppet Enterprise. Uh, very easy to set it up that way in Puppet Enterprise. Um, uh, one master could probably go to about 1,000 nodes or so, about 800 to 1,000, um, and then it's very pretty easy to scale out after that. Um, and there's this entire ecosystem there to support you. So we have uh, support that can be provided. We do 24-7 phone support. Um, we have training, certification, all kinds of services. Um, if you're a Puppet Enterprise customer, you can uh, hire professional services to come out and help you with some of your implementations. That would be me. I go out and help you set up your stuff. Um, in all seriousness, we have a lot of a lot of very smart professional services engineers that will come out and help you. Um, and basically, this whole Puppet Enterprise ecosystem, where all of these open source tools are sort of tested and built to work exactly together, um, and so you don't need to worry about building your own massive infrastructure around all of this. You saw a few slides ago. I had that picture where. Um, we see there's all the other components that can be used to support that, and we'll go into some more detail about some of them later when I get to the open source part. Um, you don't have to set all, that, set all that up yourself. It's all there, and you have a great support ecosystem uh, to help you. Uh, and so ultimately, you can get there faster. So you don't have to do nearly as much work to get set up. You don't have to do as much work to figure out what the heck happened on your systems. It's all just set up for you. And so some of these things, for instance, we have this feature called Event Inspector, which is a new Puppet Enterprise <coughs> feature added last year. Um, that's honestly a brilliant UI. Um, and I'm not normally one to talk about how great GUIs are. I'm really a command line guy myself. Um, but the event, event Inspector UI is incredible. You can easily see where the changes are in your infrastructure and very rapidly drill down. And I think um, later on we're going to have a Puppet Enterprise demo and uh, David's going to, uh, or Robert's going to show us some of the, sorry. <laughs> Robert's going to show us, uh, show us through some of this. It's really, really cool, so I'll save it for that. Um, we also have a live management interface, which is a sort of graphical orchestration tool. So contrary to the state-based configuration management that we would be doing with Puppet, where we say, this is how the server is supposed to be, make sure it stays that way. With this live, inter live management interface, we can graphically inspect and pull data in real time from all of our servers as they exist right now, as opposed to historical reports. We can also do things like trigger Puppet runs or stop Puppet from making changes if there's some kind of an emergency. Um, uh, additionally, we have a cloud provisioner, so really simple, um, really simple command line tool to spin up new machines uh, in, in a quote-unquote cloud. Um, and additionally, Puppet Enterprise ships by default with VMware support, so you can easily bring up new vCenter VMs with just a single command. Um, and there it goes again. I'm starting to get not funny anymore. I'm running out of jokes that I can make about the fact that my keynote keeps crashing. Crowdsource. Yeah, maybe you guys have everybody like hold up a slide and take turns. Like, oh, crowdsource the jokes. Oh, crowdsource the jokes. Maybe it's a good joke. Uh, Carol will walk around with a mic later and you can just tell me a cool joke. Um, where is that? Okay, support modules. So, so one additional thing in Puppet Enterprise, uh, we have a. I think the number is about 20 right now, and it increases with every release of Puppet modules that are supported officially by Puppet, by Puppet Labs. Now, what I mean by that the module is officially supported, I mean that we have thoroughly tested it on every supported platform. Okay, so there are thousands of modules in the Puppet Forge right now. Most of them are community community built. Many of them are built by Puppet Labs employees, but most of them are from the community. Um, and there's not really any guarantee that upgrades in Puppet or upgrades to the module aren't going to break something in your system. So we thoroughly test these against a huge test matrix that shows against all of our supported versions of Puppet Enterprise and open source Puppet. Uh, and we guarantee that these modules will work. And when we make changes to Puppet itself, we test it against these modules to make sure that that change doesn't negatively impact the module. Uh, and so they're very, very stable. They are excellent modules. And we provide a support guarantee on them. These are something that you can call us up and say, <clears throat> hey, the Puppet Labs Apache module is not working for reason X, Y, Z, and we will be able to help you because we have gone through it with a fine tooth comb and know exactly everything that's in there. Um, which is not to say that there's not a lot of excellent modules on the Community Forge, um, but these are ones that we have thoroughly tested and we stand behind. Um, so yeah, here's a big checklist of supported modules and the supported operating systems. All of this is documented. 
uh, on the Forge website when you want to see a particular module, if it's supported for your operating system. Uh, these are how we build them out and test them. I expect that these green check marks will start to rapidly increase and we'll get a lot more of them. Um, and so speaking of the Forge, uh, I mentioned that a little bit. I talked about supported modules. And I'm kind of kind of glazing over a lot of stuff because I saw a ton of hands go up that people have been using Puppet for at least a year. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Forge is a public module repository where you can upload and download Puppet modules to configure specific services. So say, for example, you want to configure NTP. You don't need to write the Puppet code to do that. You can just grab a Forge module and include it in your existing code. And you don't need to do any extra stuff to configure that, except for maybe set settings within that. And there's a bunch of those out there. Uh, NTP is the example here. There's Okay, so as of the time this screenshot was taken, there's a little over 2,000 modules available. There are many, many more for all kinds of applications. Okay, so this should sort of be the first stop when you're writing Puppet code to see, well, hey, I need to manage this thing. Before you go and write your own, check this out and see if somebody's already done it for you, because they've probably encountered a lot more problems than you have in the, the span of writing that. <coughs> So, open source Puppet. So like I said before, Puppet Enterprise is a collection of multiple open source products. Puppet itself being one of those open source products. If you want to, you can go out and download Puppet and use it for free and never pay us a dime. And frankly, I'm okay with that because the more people that use it, the happier sysadmins there are and then uh, the less bar fights I get into. Um, so, I don't get into bar fights, I'm just kidding. Uh, look at me. Um, <laughs> So, so we sort of have our open source products as a, as a basic proving ground, okay? So um, we provide Puppet Enterprise with a two-year support guarantee at least for, for the versions that are out there, and we can't make crazy breaking changes in that time, okay? It's, it's really hard to go out and, uh, and change something when it's going to break something for half of your customers that you promise, hey, we're going to support this for the next two years. So open source is sort of where we put all of our bleeding edge stuff. It usually leads Enterprise by a couple of months. Uh, in terms of what features are available out there. And this is where we, we sort of let the community try it out and let things get baked in and see where unex completely unexpected changes might happen. So you know, if we change something, is it going to break somebody's use case? Uh, and so open source is the place where we test all of this stuff out before it gets baked into Puffin Enterprise. Um, Additionally, it's a number of smaller components where Puppet Enterprise is, is sort of one large um, sort of combination of all of these tools. Um, Meant, to, meant to, to match a general use case that, that works for pretty much everybody that I've encountered. Um, the open source, open source components are all sort of small kernels that you would fit together yourself. So for example, Puppet Enterprise comes with the report, report interface that lets you graphically see where all of your reports are coming from. That's not built into open source Puppet. Open source Puppet is just the master and the agent and just the configuration piece. Uh, it doesn't come with mCollective for orchestration or anything like that. It's a separate piece that you need to add in. And yes, you can take all of these and put them together yourself, but Enterprise just sort of does that for you. Um, a lot of people, however, really like that. There's a lot of a lot of companies with a lot of really smart people with um, you know the kind of engineering time where they can they can devote to building these and putting these components together. And for them, Puppet Open Source is really the best solution. It doesn't make sense for them to use to use Enterprise, which is somewhat opinionated implementation, uh, and they want to have all of those components and spend you know weeks to months working on things and updating them and making sure that they're always working. Um, and you know, the companies that can do that, I don't blame them. They've got really smart people there. Not to say that, that anybody, that enterprise companies know, it's just that not everybody has the time. So like I said, Puppet is sort of that core configuration language. It's open source itself. It's under the Apache 2 license. Uh, anybody, if you want, you can go on GitHub and you can download it and you can play around with the source code. You can submit pull requests. Please submit pull requests. Um, and essentially, this is just the language. This is the service for running the master and the transaction system for applying those catalogs. It's a resource abstraction layer. I didn't really talk about that much. But it's the thing that lets you translate a package into yum install or rpm-q uh, or app get or, or msi exec or something like that. Um, and the modules are also sort of part of the forge, although it's not technically part of core puppet. Um, but this is sort of the, the, the key thing that everything is built around. So you're getting Puppet Enterprise, you're getting open source Puppet. It's pretty much the exact same Puppet. Um, there's a few small tweaks to make it work um, in the way that we have Enterprise set up, but nothing that really makes a difference in the way that you're going to use it. Um, so this language is, is, as I showed in the example before, there's some really important things to understand about it. The first one is that the code in that, the code in that uh, your Puppet code is what we call item potent. 
meaning that every time you apply this code, you should get the same result at the end. So if I take a brand new system with nothing on it and I apply my public code to it, at the end of that, all the right packages are installed, all the right configuration files are in place, all the right services are running with the correct configuration. If I take that same puppet code and apply it to a system that's been running for, I don't know, a year and has a bunch of things missing or disabled or turned off or misconfigured, I end up with the same exact end result as I did before from the brand new system. Okay? And every time I run it, we get back to the exact same state. So we're constantly converging to that correct system state, and it should happen within a single puppet run. Okay? And that's what the puppet code is, is sort of defining for you. Um, the other important thing to understand about the language is that it's model driven. So your puppet code is not telling you, log into a system, run this command, then send through this configuration file, and then run service Apache start, okay? We are saying, this is what I want the state of the system to be. We're defining a model of the system state, and then Puppet is going to enforce that model. So in other words, and this is, this is great for, for those of you who've been using Puppet for a while, remember this always, do not tell Puppet what to do. Tell Puppet what you want the system to look like, and it will figure out how to do it, okay? So describe the end state and then let Puppet get there. <coughs> All right, so um, another tool in the ecosystem, this comes built into Puppet Enterprise. Um, it, it is a separate tool from Puppet. You can use it without using Puppet at all, something called mCollective. It's a, a sort of parallelized remote execution framework. So I talked, I talked a little bit about the model in Puppet, how it's important to say that you're defining a system state and you're enforcing that state configuration over time. Every time Puppet runs, we make sure that state's the same way. Sometimes you don't want to do that. You don't want to have a defined system state that you constantly enforce. You want to do something like stop every Apache server or stop every firewall service in your entire infrastructure because there's some big problem. Not that you'd ever really want to stop all of your firewalls. Um, or for instance, you want to stop Puppet from running because hey, we have a maintenance window, or hey, there was some huge emergency and we need to make sure that no configuration changes get made for the next two days. Uh, you can use mCollective to go out, go out and make those sort of immediate ad hoc changes as long as you're comfortable with the fact that eventually you want them to be put back. Okay, so mCollective is great for sort of interacting with all of your systems en masse in a way that's not continual configuration management. Okay, I don't recommend using mCollective as a replacement for Puppet, it's terrible at that. Uh, but it's great for doing it's great for doing sort of immediate orchestration tasks, or if you need to do something that you you know run commands across multiple servers or something like that. So where Puppet is to find the state, M Collective is do this thing lots of times or collect this information from lots of servers, and it's really really good at that. Um, Puppet DB is another open source component that we bundle in Puppet Enterprise. Um, this is sort of the ultimate Puppet data source. So we've designed this so that all the data that gets generated during Puppet's existence, and there is a lot of it, um, <coughs> all of this goes into Puppet DB. So for example, all of those reports that come back from a Puppet run, they go into Puppet DB. If you have resources that need to be exported and then applied to other machines during a different Puppet run, that goes into Puppet DB. All of those facts that come out of a Puppet run at the very beginning to help the master decide which configurations you should get, all of that goes into Puppet DB. So this is sort of just a massive data store that's designed to be very, very, very fast and highly scalable. <coughs> I think when this first came out, the, uh, the lead engineer on that, uh, he set it up on his laptop and simulated it running 10,000 nodes on his laptop with just Puppet DB. So this is a really, really powerful, powerful tool for collecting data and storing it and retrieving it really, really quickly. Um, factor, again, this, this one actually is a critical component to Puppet. You can't really do it, use Puppet at all without Factor. It's a hard dependency. So a really simple tool that just collects information about your system and sends it back somewhere or prints it out to the console. Now again, this is not data like what is the state of this configuration file or what services are running or things like that. This is what is my IP address? What's my MAC address? Um, am I running on a VMware platform or not? This is the kind of information that you get out of Factor and it's just a really simple straight up tool to use. Um, Factor is so simple and easy to use that there are actually some competitors that have bundled Factor into their product. I won't name them. Uh, <laughs> so Hyra is another, another open source tool. This is actually not really separate. This is now built directly into Puppet, and this is sort of an external data tool. How many people here are using Hyra? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, awesome. Hyra is probably the best way right now to, to externalize data. So say you need to make a decision about how many, uh, which NTP server do I use on a system, or what's my main LDAP authentication server? 
And you write your puppet code in such a way that you don't want to have tons of conditional logic to figure out well, what data center am I in, and is this a development server or a production server, or put any of that logic into your code. You want your code to just be simple and say, well, I need a configuration file, and somewhere here I'm going to need to put a server IP address in it. Um, Hira is a great way to externalize that. So you can easily use a variable in the puppet, co puppet code and then tell it to call out to Hira. This also gives you the advantage of automatically binding that data into Puppet if you use it as a class parameter. Uh, any of those values will get pulled out automatically based on the facts, based on the hierarchy that you set up to define that data. That's kind of a lot, but just consider it external data. Um, we are externalizing where the values come from. And this makes it really easy to take a forge module that was written with a general use case in mind and then use it with the specifics of your infrastructure without having to open it up and start modifying the code. Uh, we'll have time for questions after uh, Kara's going to come around with the mic. Um, so just hold on to that. Um, so lastly, Razor. Um, this is sort of a new one. Um, we have a tech preview of this available in Puppet Enterprise. We haven't bundled it yet. There's, there's still a lot of sort of figuring out what the best use cases are and what people like to use about it the most and how we should sort of focus our UI on around it. But what Razor is is a filter-driven provisioning system. So think of it as kind of like the next generation of system provisioning. So the idea behind Razor is that you have a central server that contains a list of rules for how a machine should be built and configured. So where Puppet works after the operating system is already installed, right? That you've got an OS, you've got a Puppet agent installed, and then you start doing configuration with Puppet. Razor works from the very beginning of the system's life. So you rack it, you plug it in, you turn it on, and that's where Razor takes over. Okay? So Razor works off of Pixie. Um, you Pixie boot the server, it contacts the Razor server, and downloads a special kind of microkernel that has Factor installed on it already that collects all that information about the server. And then based on those fact filters, you can assign different kinds of installations to those systems. So uh, think, for example, you have you know, 1,000 machines in your data center, and you say, I need to have 10 database servers. They need to all be 32 gigs of RAM with two CPU cores. What Razor will do is automatically, as soon as those machines come up that meet that filter criteria, it will start uh, an installation. It will install the OS. It will install the Puppet Agent. It will classify it at the Puppet Master. And then you're going to have a machine up and ready to go without having to do anything. Essentially, the, the, the real value of this is in bare metal, where you can now provision bare metal servers like you would a cloud instance. Or you can just say ahead of time, I want this. And then as soon as the hardware becomes available, you've got it. So it's really, really neat. Uh, again, it's tech preview right now, but I encourage anyone to go out and try it and tell us what you think. Tell us, find bugs. Uh, tell us what sort of things need to be fixed. Um, it's it's really, really great tool. So Puppet Labs is sort of like a career-oriented thing. There's some pictures. You can see a lot of really happy people eating free lunch on Wednesdays. Um, you can see our coffee machines and our really expensive espresso grinder. Um, it's an awesome place to work. Puppet is based out of Portland, Oregon, um, although we are hiring all over the place. I myself am based in New York City. Um, I think there's maybe two people here from Puppet that are actually based in Portland out of the five or so of us. Um, we sort of have customers all over the place. So uh, in my capacity as professional services, I, I end up going you know, sort of everywhere. Uh, Puppet is not a sector-specific thing. A lot of people sort of see you know, all the hip web ops shops, you know, everybody running like Ruby on Rails or whatever. Uh, they're they're common, more commonly using those uh, configuration management tools and that sort of thing, but we are not just a you know, hot startup tool. Um, it's used all over the place from large government to telecom companies and of course all of the crazy startups. So these are just some logos. Um, marketing I'm sure loves to show this. It looks really cool. It's really pretty. <laughs> Um, and of course, we're hiring. Um, all of these, all of these jobs are still open. Um, we are constantly hiring. Professional services, we are definitely, definitely hiring. Um, we can't keep up. We need more people. Um, if you go to publiclabs.com/about/careers, um, you'll see a list of all of these, and you can apply directly online. Um, if you have any questions about what it's like to work at Puppet, if you're curious about any of that, come talk to me or anybody wearing a Puppet T-shirt or a Puppet polo shirt. Um, I'm too cool to wear the t-shirt, I guess. Uh, so, what was that? Oh. Yeah, don't, don't ask those guys in puppet shirts. So the, the, the great polos, for the most part, and, uh, Carol with, and, and green hair. So if you have a great polo or a green hair, then, uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to talk to you about working a puppet. Um, so, um, Regardless of what you do, if you're using Puppet, I highly recommend that you get involved with the community. We have a number of ways that you can do that. Um, 
the, the community is really probably our strongest aspect. We have a great community full of really smart, really helpful people, and for the most part, very nice people. Um, so don't ever be afraid to ask questions or go out and learn from other people or share your experiences. And that's honestly what puppet camps are really all about. So you know, talk to people, talk to us, um, talk about your experience, talk about what you love, what you hate about puppet. Um, we also have the site ask.puppetlabs.com, which is sort of like a Stack Exchange clone. Um, but specifically focused on Puppet, where you can go in and you can post a question and then you can answer a question. Um, if you want to be really cool and sort of increase your clout, um, you can answer lots of questions like we did. This guy actually was our top, uh, that picture there, he was our top question answer on ask.com and so we were basically forced to hire him. Um, and so he works in support now. Um, <laughs> Really smart guy. Um, our mailing list, we have a Puppet users mailing list that's really good uh, for Puppet Enterprise users. There's a PE users mailing list. These are not, by the way, sort of you know uh, upper class, lower class mailing lists. They're more towards specific use cases of the different things. So PE users is really focused on Puppet Enterprise specific questions about how the Puppet Enterprise stack is being used. Um, but great mailing lists, all the same. Lots of people love to go on and help. Um, Puppet Labs employees and a few more who help a lot more than the employees, but they're really smart and they just won't come work for us. Um, IRC, anybody here use IRC? See, like it's, a, it's a small show of hands for, for that, but um, our IRC channel is very active. There's usually about 1,000 people idling in Pound Puppet on Freenode, and so for you know, if you want to talk real time about Puppet really quickly, it's right there. I'm Super Cal on IRC. If you ever want to ping me and ask me some questions, I'm happy to help with that. Um, we also do semi-periodic. I'm not sure. We just had one uh, this past week, sort of bug triages, where everybody gets together. If you're in Portland, you can come to the Portland office and start uh, working on bugs and sort of just go through and squash bugs. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, contribute code, contribute forge modules. Nobody's going to be a jerk to you if you contribute code that doesn't look right or, or isn't nice. We're going to help you make it better. Um, we're really, really devoted to helping the community become better. And so if even if you're not really sure or you're not super confident in your abilities, definitely still submit code, submit a module. It's great. People will fall over themselves to help you. Um, we have a great training program. Um, this will probably change soon um, to be even greater, but um, for those of you who are brand new to Puppet or trying to get people in your organization interested in Puppet um, or are up to speed on Puppet so that they can do all the same cool things that you've been doing, uh, the Puppet Fundamentals training is fantastic. Um, it, it's very highly reviewed, it's always great. I'm, I'm biased because I've taught it, um, but I think it's always a ton of fun. Um, we also have an advanced Puppet training for people who have been using Puppet for several months and have already taken fundamentals and really understand the basics and are looking for something sort of more. Um, uh, and then after all of these, we also have uh, both a Puppet professional and Puppet developer certification uh, to sort of certify that, yep, you're awesome at Puppet, and I know everybody loves to have cert certificates, um, put the numbers in your email signatures and all that. Um, yeah, the trainings are all over the place. I think these countries in red are where we've had them. That is, there's definitely more than that. I know we've had more in Asia. Um, people love the trainings. That's, I'll let the people speak for themselves with those quotes. Uh, and you know, if, if going out and paying for training and sitting in a classroom for three days isn't your thing, although again, it's not just sitting and listening to lectures, they're highly interactive with major, major lab components. Um, we have great online training that's also not just sort of sit and watch. There's a lot of examples and hands-on stuff that you can do. You can download our learning VM. We have all kinds of different exercises and a sort of like game-based way of going through and learning Puppet. So if you prefer to just sit down and learn on your own, this is a great place to start. Puppet, PuppetLabs.com slash learn. Really, really good for, pup, for learning Puppet. I think I saw a test pilot shirt in here before, over there. Yeah, awesome. So if you want, if you want that guy's T-shirt, um, not the one he's wearing right now, um, <laughs> you can keep the one you're wearing. Uh, um, join our test pilot program. So this is done by our user experience team. Basically, we want we want to get a better understanding constantly of how you're working and what's painful for you in managing systems. Uh, and so this is your chance to see new products from Puppet or sort of show us what your workflow is like and where your challenges are and heavily influence what our product roadmap is. So based on this, we decide sort of how we're going to go through and like what features we're going to work on or how, what they're going to look like to try to solve your problems in the best possible way. So basically, you get to be a guinea pig. Um, you get an Amazon gift card and you get a t-shirt for your troubles. Um, you can do it remotely. It's a lot of fun. It usually takes 30 to 60 minutes. It's, it's really not a problem at all. Um, 
puppetlabs.com slash PTP for Puppet Test Pilot. We also have some business cards floating around up there that have more details if you need them. Uh, PuppetConf, yes. Probably the, the, I mean, maybe again I'm biased, but it's the most fun that I ever had at a conference ever. Um, we do these every year in San Francisco. This year is going to be September uh, 20th to 24th. Uh, Again, in San Francisco, there's training beforehand if you want to come in uh, a few days prior and then have the training. There will be lots of training there. Uh, you get to meet tons of people, tons and tons of people from all over. Like Anybody who's really great at Puppet is going to be there. Um, anybody who's really interested in Puppet should be there. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a great, it's a fantastic conference. Um, if you would like to win a ticket for free admission, drop your business card into the fishbowl by registration, if any of you haven't done that before. Uh, at 4 o'clock, we're going to draw for a free public con uh, admission. Uh, and that's sort of that. So questions, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, Kara will get a mic to you. You were holding on to that one, weren't you? That's yeah. good. Yeah, hi. Just want to ask if there, how much overlap is there between Puppet DB and Hiera? Um, in that, you know, what would, it, would data live in both? And if you go to update one, the other has, does the other yeah. have to refresh? It's a good question. So, so Hiera is really meant for specifying data. So when you type that in, the most common use for for Hiera, I'd say 90% of the use case is in YAML files that you check into version control. So Hira is about defining the way that something should be, whereas PuppetDB is this is the way that it is or has been. And so you can think of PuppetDB as more something that you collect data from, and uh, like as as uh, the life cycle of your infrastructure goes on, you pull data, like data goes into PuppetDB sort of automatically, <coughs> whereas Hira is more for specifying what certain settings should be. Yeah, part of my confusion is that there are like database backends for right. Hira. So I, when PuppetDB sure. came so to the... Sure. So to repeat that, he's, uh, he's saying that the uh, a lot of the confusion comes from the fact that there are database backends for Hira. Now, I didn't I didn't go into a lot of detail about Hira because I don't have time to do all of that. You know, we spent days training on all this stuff. But uh, um, so Hira, in addition to having simple text-based uh, sources for data, also has a number of ways that you can pull data from external services. So some people will put their configuration data into Postgres or into MySQL or something like that, um, or possibly integrate it with some existing configuration management database that they have, so that somebody who's completely unrelated to the infrastructure team can specify certain settings and they can go through something else. So the idea with Hira is that the backends are extremely flexible, and the data that you're using it really could come from anywhere if you configure it that way. PuppetDB, though, is really more about reporting and storing. I got two questions. First is, your life cycle shows changing the configuration back to where it was. Do you use it as a auditing tool? Uh, like, hey, somebody made changes, but we don't want to change them back. We just want to highlight them and say, here's the changes to the baseline. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just going to pull that slide up again because I love it so much. Um, and hopefully not crash keynote. So, so the, the a really, really cool thing about this, and this is something that's that's really key to Puppet, is that that catalog that comes down that defines the system state, the agent is going to apply it by comparing each resource and setting them, right? You don't have to actually set them. Puppet has something called a no-op mode, where for each of these resources, rather than making a change about it, it will note that there needs to be a change and send that back to the report server. So auditing is sort of built into this, whether you're making the changes or not, because all that data is coming back for the reports. But there are a lot of places that will just leave Puppet in no-op mode for a while and say, well, is this thing the way that it's supposed to be because they're scared of having those changes happen automatically? Uh, and so no-op mode will take care of that. Second question, you mentioned VMware. Do you have plans to do other VM products like Rev, Red um, Hat virtualization? So I don't know. Um, there are a number of virtualization products that we work very closely with, though. Um, I think we have partners, partnerships with Google and Microsoft right now for their cloud services. Um, OpenStack uses Puppet very heavily. Uh, in fact, I think it's the most common way to configure OpenStack services. Uh, I think Rev, actually, Red Hat is bundling Puppet into it for that. Um, so so there, it's not like VMware is the only one that we support. Um, we have partnerships with a number of different virtualization providers. I think they, Red Hat has put Puppet into the new satellite. Yeah, their new satellite replacements. 
We've got that, and that hooks into Puppet Enterprise too. <coughs> uh, so we're in evaluating OpenStack, and curious about how uh, Puppet Enterprise interacts or supplants or replaces. How, how do they work together? Absolutely work together, and they are they are definitely not. There, there's not really a significant overlap between what Puppet and OpenStack do. So OpenStack sort of is a way for you to define this dynamic infrastructure, sort of build your own private cloud, whereas Puppet is a way that you manage the configuration of that private cloud. So typically in OpenStack, you would have a Puppet agent installed on, first of all, on all of your OpenStack infrastructure machines, you know, the machines that are actually providing the OpenStack services, as well as have a Puppet agent installed by default when you bring up a new machine in that OpenStack environment. So OpenStack sort of handles the lower level, and then Puppet handles the level above that. Um, and there are public, if you're looking at OpenStack right now, I recommend you check out the Forge. There are, there are Forge modules for OpenStack that kind of just do the whole thing for you almost automatically. So there's not really any overlap between uh, Puppet Enterprise and OpenStack? Um, not overlap in that sense. I would yeah. say synergy. They work very <laughs> well together. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I work for a small bootstrap startup, and um, there are a lot of competing priorities for funding. Um, we we do, even though we're a small company, we still have kind of like a big server footprint. And I'm wondering if it's possible to use like a hybrid of Puppet Enterprise and open source Puppet to, uh, you know, maybe keep some of those costs down until you know we get some funding or a huge contract or something like that. Sure. So so that's pop. So that's possible, and I've seen people do that. Um, the most common way that people will be using open source Puppet in combination with Enterprise is if they're running on an unsupported platform. So for instance, we don't support Enterprise on Gen2. And so sometimes people will use, or FreeBSD for example, sometimes people will use um, open source Puppet for those nodes and then use Puppet Enterprise for everything else. Um, Puppet Enterprise is licensed per agent. So each agent that you're using, basically each certificate that you have signed for the secure communication uh, consumes a license. You can connect an open source agent to an enterprise master. However, that open source agent will still consume a license. So you do need licenses for each of those open source systems and we can't officially support them because anything could happen on those. We don't really know, we don't control it as well. Um, so to answer your question, you can, like a, another possibility is to maybe have open source in a dev environment and then have enterprise in production and have separate masters for them. But every agent that connects to an enterprise master consumes a license. I have some questions in the back. Yeah, I got two questions. Oh, oh, there. First question is, the auditing, is that available in the open source version or is that commercial? You're talking about the no-op that I was talking yeah. about? That's built into the open source version. Okay. Second question, I got some here to compare and transfer as a CF engine, so what's the benefit? So, I'm not really a big fan of, of bad-mouthing competitors uh, in public spaces, especially up here with a bully pulpit. I think CF Engine is an excellent tool. Um, and if you had to choose between CF Engine and writing custom bash scripts, I would encourage you to use CF Engine and see what it is. That's the best way. Obviously, I would prefer that you use Puppet. I think that Puppet is a lot I'm not going to go into it, but yeah. Um, if, if you want, if you want to chat with me about more more competitor stuff, feel free to grab me afterwards. I'm just not going to stand up here and you know make marketing pitches against our competitors. I'll hit you on IRC later. Yes, hit me on IRC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm here all day. Um, there's a few Puppet uh, testing frameworks, right? Things like RSpec, uh, Puppet, or uh, Beaker, or ServerSpec. Are there testing tools that you guys stand behind a little bit more than others? Or? Um, yeah. Our spec Puppet and Beaker are pretty much the standards right now. Those are what we use internally for our own testing. Beaker is a Puppet created tool. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's any others out there that we would stand behind more. Maybe um, Puppet Lin, that's a third party tool that we use pretty heavily. But I mean, those three kind of cover the vast majority of your Puppet code testing. So for those of you who aren't familiar, he's talking about some testing tools that we have. Um, RSpec Puppet is a spec testing tool to sort of verify the logic in your code. So what that does is it compiles the catalog in this step and then verifies that that catalog meets certain criteria that you've specified. So you can do this to make sure that the logic in your code isn't doing anything crazy and when you change something, you can make sure that it didn't break anything else that you didn't expect. Beaker is a step further than that that builds a catalog and actually provisions a system, currently either right now in Vagrant or vSphere, applies the public catalog to it and then uses a tool called ServerSpec to verify whether or not those changes are in place or not. 
So both of them are really, really good. And if you're doing any kind of integration testing um, or any kind of automatic testing, which you should be, by the way, um, RSpec Puppet and Beaker are fantastic tools for that. Uh, Puppet Lint is just a style validator to make sure that your code matches the Puppet style guidelines. <coughs> Question there? I'll, I'll repeat what you said. I'll let Kara pass the mic over. We're headed, we'll be next. Okay. We're going to come around. We still have oh, four okay. minutes. There we go. Um, so I was wondering, um, is there any way or does uh, the public master has a problem um, with, say, if you're managing the configuration of thousands of nodes um, and all of them are actually trying to run once, probably every 30 minutes or anything like that. So are the, the that thundering herd? Is a problem or um, can public basically handle that many systems at one time? So a thousand machines all at the exact same time probably will cause problems. That will slow things down significantly. So to talk really briefly about performance, um, the master's main uh, constraint is CPU. Uh, it's using CPU to build those catalogs out of the public code. Um, now there's, there's sort of two things here that you can do. One is don't let all your agents, all your thousand agents check in at the exact same 30 minute interval. Um, the Puppet daemon by default will display that semi-randomly. Um, so they probably won't all be checking in at once. Um, additionally, some people I've seen run the agent out of cron uh, and using Puppet code to set up that cron job will have it run at a random offset based off the FQDN of the server. So it'll sort of split off to some point during that 30 minute interval and should be relatively well spread out. Um, so that's sort of the first thing. If you have all your thousand machines checking in at once, that's, that's gonna be bad for any kind of service, right? You know, all of your users hit it at the exact same moment. Um, and that probably will slow things down and you could fail catalogs. The other thing you can do is scale out. Um, the primary thing that you would scale here in Puppet is the Puppet Master itself, and that really just works as a simple web service. You can install multiple Puppet Masters, put them all behind a load balancer, and have the agents connect to whichever. And it scales very easily that way. Uh, can you repeat what you just said? What was that? About scalability? Yeah. Or load balancer? The, the, the balancer. Oh yeah, so you can put your Puppet Masters behind a load balancer, and have your agents connect to the load balancer VIP, and then have that distribute the load to the different masters. Uh, over there first. I do a whole lot of air gap systems. Mm -hmm. So for Puppet Enterprise, how does licensing work for these kinds of environments? Specifically the reporting and auditing and that sort of thing. So when you say air gaps, can you put your, your master within the <coughs> isolated network? I mean, this will never touch the public internet because oh. it's... It doesn't report that publicly for that. Now there is something in Puppet Enterprise that will send back usage statistics, but that doesn't block anything from working. The licensing is, is managed entirely from the master, and we don't actually report back on license consumption. Um, you'll just get a, a warning message saying, hey, this doesn't, you're, you're not in compliance with your license. Okay, so it's a, for as far as public labs concerned, it's like you buy uh, 50 node licenses, and it's kind of on your honor to... Yeah, pretty much, the, on your honor. We're trusting you to not, to not steal all those licenses okay. from us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> having, having dealt with Microsoft in the past and all their CAs and stupid stuff, yeah. We're a company that comes from the, the were sysadmins that founded it, and something like that would drive us up the freaking wall, and I, for one, would never, never sit still while something like that happened. I think we had some questions over here. Previously, at where we were working now, um, someone had installed Puppet on Windows 27, and they were using Nginx. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the differences between Apache versus Nginx and the kind of performance you should say? Sure. So the kind of thing you're talking about there is, and I touched on this briefly when we started talking about uh, Puppet Enterprise and the sort of scalability that that adds in. Uh, so Puppet, by default, if you just install a Puppet package from our Yum repository and run it, the open source version, it's using a Ruby service called WebRick, which is a single threaded web server, which is why we say that it starts to fall over after more than a dozen, two dozen nodes. I think I said 50 before. Um, so what you're going to do if you're running Puppet in production is you need to run that within a sort of Ruby application framework. So in Puppet Enterprise, we build that into Apache and Passenger. Okay, now I've seen other people also run, uh, that, that generally is the most tested way. Um, there are a lot of people running this with Nginx. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with that specific setup internally. Um, so you'll probably get better support if you're running Apache and Passenger. Uh, much better support if you're just running Puppet Enterprise. Um, 
But that's generally the reason that I see it. I don't think I don't think it's super common to run it behind Nginx. I've, I've at least never personally encountered it directly. I think over here. I have a comment. Uh, oh, are we running low? Yeah, you had a comment on that, Trevor? I just had a comment on that. Um, one of the reasons that I see people not use it under Nginx is because you have to recompile Nginx to build it in Apache code, whereas in Apache you just drop the module. <laughs> Seems like so this is the last question. And guys, feel free feel free to like come come to me afterwards. You know, if you're shy or you didn't get time for your question, I'm I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. I was reading online and I have a multi-architectural environment, so I know how to work with my red hat and my virtual VMs, but I have S390X Z Linux, and I saw in the past that there were problems with the new 3.2. Will that work? On Z Linux? Z Linux, does it work pretty good with Z Linux? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so for Puppet Enterprise, we have a list of supported platforms. I don't think that's supported for PE. Um, I think the closest we have AIX is supported. That's about the closest. I've never, ever used Z Linux. Um, I'm not a fan either, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I just don't know anything about it. Um, but, I mean, there, there are a large number of platforms and architectures that we support. Um, I just don't know anything about that one. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, first of all, thanks, James. <laughs>